Hey everyone, welcome to another private investigator advice video. And in this video, we're going to be doing a surveillance audit. Now, uh, a reader uh, and watcher and, and and listener of the the podcast had, had reached out and he said, "Hey man, how do you how do you stop from getting burned on surveillances?" And I dug in a little bit deeper. And, uh, and this is what he had to say. I'll read this to you. And then we're going to jump into this board over here and break down his surveillance and kind of see where he went wrong. I'll be sharing some things to, to help you if you're watching this to make you a better surveillance investigator. So let's go ahead and jump into his message. He says, I was set up on the residence about four houses down due to the, the way the crescent went. The subject had their roof done that morning, and because they were having their roof done, they had to move their vehicles out of the driveway. Well, my luck, they ended up moving the vehicle right in front of my car. So my husband, uh, so my, uh, uh, excuse me, in front of my car, so the husband of the subject saw me. After he went back inside the house, I moved my car without having to drive by the subject's uh, house and repositioned on the other side of the crescent out of view with, uh, out of a view with the residents. They ended up leaving the house together and it worked in a truck and went to a neighborhood supermarket. There, there was a pharmacy store inside the supermarket. I went inside there to look for the subject. I found the subject at the back of the pharmacy filling a prescription and I started to get video. My biggest thing is how do you get video in such a manner that can assist in the subject not making you or seeing you do doing the video? This is because she turned around at one point and looked at me and then looked at my, directly down at my hand which was holding the camcorder videotaping her. I then walked out of the pharmacy because I had been burnt and she followed behind me but I was able to make a good escape. All right. So you probably already realize where this went wrong, but we're going to break it down anyways and and pick out some different areas what he could have done better um, you, for things for you to consider and uh, and how just overall how to be a better private investigator as you're breaking down your own surveillances. So let's go ahead and get into it. All right, everyone. So we're going to get into the breakdown and kind of do a little bit of a surveillance audit. Uh, for, you know, for the private investigator that I, you know, we just discussed and how his surveillance evolved. So I think the first thing we're going to do is we're going to go ahead and um, talk about has the surveillance been worked before? Now, even if the private investigator, you know, like, you know, the private investigator that's worked the file, even if they say, no, dude, it's good. I, I wasn't burned. It's all clean. You just never know. And I'm not testing the integrity of the private investigator that followed you, but um, sometimes you'll ask, like, well, did you use a pretext? And they'll say no, but they really did. You just always got to be on your guard when it comes to following anybody on an investigation. It's not a clean slate. You don't know what they didn't see that happened, right? Like, you don't know if they were compromised and didn't realize it. You just don't know. So that's the first thing under consideration. My second thing I would say is, is the subject that you're following, are they represented? If they are, they may have been coached by the uh, attorney, like, hey, guy, you know, you, you, the type of case you have here, private investigators may start to follow you, you know. So uh, if, if they're coached, then that's going to make a, a subject way more aware of the surroundings if they, you know, depending on the type of case you're, you're working. So that's another consideration. The next consideration is a good surveillance vehicle. What I'll do is I'm going to post some articles in uh, the uh, show notes here in regards to, to, to having the right kind of considerations for surveillance vehicles, tint, color of the vehicle, um, and, and some other things to consider as you're picking one or uh, just be mindful of your own surveillance vehicle. So that, that could play a part. Now, if you have a surveillance vehicle that's dented up, um, has bumper stickers on it, is a is a loud color like yellow or something like that these sorts of things are going to be memorable for someone who if you happen to tip them off during a surveillance right so you want to be mindful of that you want to have a good surveillance vehicle i i would say just generally speaking um, a sedan suv uh, with earth colors those are always typically the best one it's not the rule but generally speaking i i found those to be more beneficial in in the field um, and then we're going to get into the nuts and bolts of, of the story that we just heard. And we're going to break down some considerations. And you may reflect on your own surveillance as we audit this one a little bit. So he mentioned that the surveillance, that the street was kind of a crescent, right? And so I kind of envisioned it looking like this. And uh, let's just, for the sake of argument, say that this was the subject's residence right there, right? 
And uh, for also the sake of argument, if my camera will pan out here a little bit, let's say that this is the subject's vehicle or the private investigator's vehicle. And he wants to have a view of the residence and he's facing forward. I think that's also something to distinguish when you're on a surveillance, right? What's the best way, you know, if you can, if you have the choice, which is the best way to point? Now, if he's parked here, that's probably the most ideal, you know, to point forward. Um, but if for some reason he was on this side of the subject's residence, um, I would park backwards, right? If I'm facing this way, so I can look at my, my mirror. I'm, I'm less likely to be obvious to someone if they're looking at my, my back window, right? <laughs> He's probably not gonna see as much movement because my vehicle's tinted. Um, and uh, yeah, if you're pointing away, it's, it's less suspicious in a neighborhood from the subject, not necessarily everybody else, but from the subject. But from the sake of argument, I know we'll start with this one here. Now he said, you know, he got set up and he realized that there was some work being done on the house. Some roofers were coming over and uh, the all the roofers vehicles were at the house. So the subject husband, I think it was, he parked right in front of him. Now that kind of leads us to our next thing where he said, you know, the, the husband saw me. Well, that's, I, I'm of the belief based on the scenario that if he was parked like this, he could have been a guy just waiting to be a roofer, but he feels like this may have been um, a moment where it kind of maybe spooked them. I don't know that it did, but in his mind it did. And that's kind of what's important here. Um, whether, whether, whether he thinks it is or not, right. Whether he thinks it compromised anything or not. So he said he moved and I believe he pointed away. So he just kind of went over here. He didn't go in front of the residence and now he's pointed this way. He's kind of maybe probably sacrificing the view of the residence. I'm not opposed to that. Um, I don't even know that I would have moved per se. Um, uh, if I'm already given up a view, I might not even be in the area. I might leave the area, right? If I feel I'm, I'm compromised, but this is what he did. He points away. So, we're all, it's all about the proper setup. No, I don't know if you guys can see this over here. Uh, the proper setup over here, right? So you got to have a good one. Now, when I think of setup for myself, what's important? Well, I get there. I realize things are happening. Um, am I worried that the subject's going to go and start roofing? Probably not, right? Um, so for me, I might take a less aggressive approach because in my scenario here, I'm only a couple houses away, so I can have the view. It might have been more for him, but um, I, I'm the type of person who I'm thinking long game here. If I'm not going to see anything at the residence and I'm really looking for the, the moment where the subject leaves, then I might, if I know which way the egress route is, the route of the departure, uh, you know, I'm considering that, then I may park over here. If I'm, I'm, if I'm sacrificing the view of the residence, I'm just waiting for them to leave. I have all the vehicles that I need. I'm not worried about someone picking them up. They have their own cars, right? I may take a less aggressive approach because I want to get them away from the residence. I want to see what they do away from the residence, right? So consider that as you're doing your surveillance. Now, so we've talked about that. Also, I probably should bring up, well, where was he, if he's, <laughs> where was he in the vehicle? when the the subject's husband parked in front of him right now i'm i'm inclined to think that he was in the front seat because he was spooked right if if i'm going to be aggressive and and i'm just saying for this for the sake of this argument aggressive uh in my surveillance position here three or four houses away i'm opting for the back seat in the vehicle and if someone parks in front of me, I'm like trying to duck down. I don't want to be noticed because I'm being aggressive, right? And my, I'm being, uh, I'm really looking for the view of the residents, seeing what happens at the residence, who comes and goes from the residence. I'm parked, I'm sitting in the back seat. Now I've had a Honda Civic, a Santa Fe. I've had two different uh, Hyundai Santa Fe's. I've had a Toyota Highlander. I've had trucks. Um, so I've had a variety of different vehicles. And if I was a back seat, I'm opting for that in a more aggressive uh, situation. Now, if I'm not, if I'm on the, on the egress route, then that frees me up a little bit. Like, I'm not too worried about a neighbor 10 houses down seeing me in my car and questioning me. So I'm probably gonna sit in the front seat, not only because of that, but because when the subject passes me, I gotta be ready to go. Like, I gotta start my car and go, right? So I can't be, you know, trying to run from the back seat to the front seat and then get in the car and go. 
uh, it makes things so much harder, right? If you're in the back seat and you start to see someone leave, you've got all this time to kind of make your way to the front seat. You know what's happening. There's a little bit more leeway. In the other situation, they just zoom by you and you have to be ready to rock. Okay, so we talked about front or back seat and the reasons behind that. Um, the next thing we'll go is to tinted. Um, uh, have good tinted windows. At least, uh, again, I'm not gonna tell you to do anything illegal, but have your at least your back three windows tinted with limo tint. That's like a good general rule. And if you have to go lighter in the front, I get it. Um, that may work a little bit better for vans where they're a little deeper vehicles. For like a Honda Civic, it won't have much effect because it's a shallow vehicle. Uh, but have good tint, right? You gotta have tint uh, to be uh, not, not easily observed in your vehicle or easily observed in what you're doing if you're videotaping, right? And people are walking around you. You don't want them seeing you videotaping your car. Okay, so here we are. So he's spooked. He, he's parked in the opposite direction. He's waiting for them to leave. I'm sure his mind is, you know, thinking, oh man, I blew it, I burned, whatever. But uh, so the subject leaves. And this is also, and I don't, he didn't describe this in, in uh, his, uh, his message to me, but I've done this long enough to where I know how this plays out. So if he's too close to the subject's residence and the person's observed him and they may be a little bit suspicious, now they're going to pull out of the house and drive by him and then right away, for the most part, they're going to see him start to follow them. Now you've confirmed some suspicions if there were any because now they're, they're driving by you and you're following them now, right? So that could have been a red flag for the subject that they were following. And, but I don't even think, honestly, that's probably where he got burned. I really don't. As you read the story, you probably already determined where he got burned. But anyway, so he follows them to the store, right? And this is my store. <laughs> so you've got aisles here, uh, if you can, if my camera pans out properly, but you got aisles over here. And, uh, and, uh, and so what ends up happening is, uh, which like I said, if you've, if you listen to the, to the story, he's got his camera and the subject sees him and, uh, he makes a getaway cause you know, the, the woman starts to follow him and he escapes. Well, We'll get into the, the whole camera thing, but let's talk about being covert in, in stores. Uh, and there's always different scenarios. There's restaurants or stores you're going to follow these people in. But uh, a good rule of thumb is to stay out of their view uh, as much as possible. Uh, so, you know, sometimes you're going to be in, in the aisleways with them, right? And it, depending on the store, you're going to have some really long aisleways and, and that's fine, right? You want to, sometimes the video is so far away that you want to get a little bit closer to them so it can really identify who they are if someone's watching this. But I believe a good rule of thumb as much as possible is to play the aisles. So if the subjects in between the aisleway, these are my the little aisleways, I hang on the edge of the aisle and I'm basically pointing my camera down the aisle. So all, all they would see is maybe my hand and my spy camera, but it's a spy camera. So they don't know it's a spy camera. They just see a hand, right? So if there's no suspicion, to begin with, and I'm in the store with them. I'm just another customer, right? And I do space my time with them in the store. Like I'm not following row for row. Every time, every aisle, I'm not going in every single aisle. Sometimes I'll just kind of keep an eye on them, kind of keep dabs on, tabs on them. And then I'll try to videotape intermittently within the store, depending on maybe they're doing big grocery shopping. Maybe they're not. You have to be aware of that as a private investigator. So, Play the aisle ways. That would be my biggest tip for you, right? Um, the problem with, uh, oh, and I'll, I'll add this as well, because I almost forgot. When I first started, a good, good rule of thumb that I was taught was, you know, if they're going into a Walmart, to wait about five or 10 minutes to follow them in there. Now, I think it's a good rationale because sometimes people go into a store and they come right back out. And so that was the whole rationale behind the training. You know, wait 10 to 15 minutes and they may come right back out. Uh, and, and a very small percentage of the time that happens, unless you're burned and they know that and they're, they go into the store and they just wait for you to come in because they're trying to catch you, right? They're trying to, to trap you and identifying you. But generally speaking, if you can get set up and be able to follow shortly there behind them, then you're not wasting time in the store trying to find them. 
it's a pain in the butt in like a, in a large department store, a mall, um, to, to, to track them down. Sometimes you get lucky and you're like, you're right by the pharmacy and boom, there they are. That's fantastic. Um, uh, but a lot of times you're like, you're trying to circle, you're like, where is this person? And you just can't find them. You spend 15, 20 minutes just trying to track them down. And then sometimes you, you realize that they've already made their way out. So, uh, if you can do it covertly, just kind of, you know, keep an eye on them as they're walking in. You don't want to be that far behind them. So you kind of have, you can start your internal surveillance relatively quickly. All right. So we've talked about some tactics. These aren't all the tactics, but these are some good um, rules of thumb to practice. Um, in this subject, I don't know if he was practicing that because it really wouldn't matter. He was using uh, a video camera. Let me uh, <laughs> grab one here. Okay, so we're gonna talk about spy cameras and not in depth, but in the context of doing surveillance. Now, let's say he's, well, he's using the video camera. And no matter how covert you're being, <laughs> I'm sorry, if you're walking around in a store, you're gonna draw attention to yourself. These things are incredibly small and that's wonderful, but they're not a spy camera, right? There's a, there's a significant difference between the two. So inevitably, he was not covert and this is, I believe, was what burned him. But I'm gonna go ahead and set this down here. There are other options. I'll pick up my phone here. And this isn't gonna be the, the most extensive um, talk about it, but it's just a high level here, um, is using a proper spy camera. Now, I'm talking to you guys when I'm, when I'm going down the aisleways, I'm holding my, my pen in my hand like this, you know, of course, down by my side, in the aisleway like we spoke about, and no one's any the wiser, right? I mean, I've never, to my knowledge, and I'm sure I'll think of a story afterwards, maybe, <laughs> after I've read, uh, videotaped this, but where I've been burned in a store using a covert camera that I hadn't been burned already. Like I wasn't burned over here at the, um, at the, at the residence. Like if I'm just doing surveillance, I didn't get burned in here. I got burned over here. So consider that this is not usually where it happens unless you're walking around with a video camera, right? A, a camcorder. So there are some investigators that use their phone to videotape. And if you can do it covertly, like, uh, um, I know a, a, a investigator friend of mine who would stick it in her backpack and so she would kind of have it on her back shoulder and she would be looking away from the subject as it was videotaping. I watched her in action. She did a really great job with, it, with that. Meanwhile, I think I had two different spy cameras that I was leveraging, one of them being one of these pen cameras. And, you know, both of our video was good. I probably got the most because of, of uh, the way I was doing it. But, um, but the quality was still great, right? So... Um, having a good spy camera, like I, it, I will always be a proponent of something covert, like a pen, uh, the 808 keychain cameras, although they're not dependable as much as the pen cameras that I found. Um, those are, are, are great, um, great ways to get corporate video without drawing attention to yourself. I'll share more about this in the course that I'm creating about spy cameras and some of the, the benefits of certain types. Um, I'll get into that, but but for now we're going to keep it high level. So, so and all in all, you guys kind of got an idea. I've I've kind of audited this, this surveillance a little bit. You've got an understanding about my rationale, and I'm sharing that with you so you can be more mindful on your surveillance cases to kind of think ahead, take things into consideration, the whole picture, right? Um, be mindful, and this is all coming from 16 plus years of experience what I've seen, the results of what I've seen, just kind of being very self-aware of my own mistakes and then realizing when I haven't made a mistake where the fault happened in surveillance cases. So you've got your setup, you know, you're following them from there. I won't get into the mo mo mobile automobile surveillance. That's a whole nother conversation, but we got them to the store, right? And we talked about the mistakes that we made, uh, the ultimate mistake, whether, you know, he might not have been burned here at all, but the, the camera in the store was the ultimate mistake in this uh, surveillance case. I hope you enjoyed this audit. Um, if you have a case that you want audited, uh, feel free to uh, send me a message and we'll talk about it and we'll maybe talk about where things went wrong, where things could have gone better, considerations. And before I go, um, feel free to check out the uh, Private Investigator Advice book. Um, well, it's called Want to Become a Private Investigator. Uh, tips and tricks that I wish I would have known before uh, uh, getting involved in PI work. Or if you want some of the templates that I've created, 
surveillance templates, report templates, things of that nature, um, you can go ahead and uh, click here and you'll take you right to that. Thanks guys, see you later.